December? Oh, okay. Late November. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I remember. They're over. They're over. It looks best if you're sitting down, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's best if you're there because yeah. we can capture the slides. Otherwise, you'll be standing in front of the slides. Yeah. Is that, is that okay with you? Yeah. All right. And I won't be quite as dead now. Cartwheels and solid Let me check what it looks like. Sure. Because we should be live now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's good. So good, can I do the introduction? Yeah, definitely. We're good. We're good to go. Yeah. Okay, I'll step over here for a minute. Okay, I think the technical things are now all in order. Thank you very much, Steph, for, for doing that. My name is Michael McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus of applied ethics and uh, from the W. Morris Young Center for Applied Ethics who is sponsoring this talk in conjunction with the Center for Research on Personhood and Dementia, which is a BC-based virtual research center located on our campus. And it's led by Deborah O'Connor and Alison Dillon, who is here today. And uh, they are a, a hub for research, uh, generation training, and knowledge application around issues of personhood and citizenship and dementia. And um, Daryl Pullman, uh, I'm very pleased to do this here, to give a talk on the uh, in a familiar voice the dominant role of women in shaping Canadian met policy on medical assistance in dying and uh, Daryl is a professor of medical ethics at the, the Faculty of Medicine at Memorial University of Newfoundland he received his MA and PhD in philosophy from the University of Waterloo I was one of his mentors there in fact I was involved in his admission to graduate school <laughs> I remember many years ago and Daryl did some amazing work was a graduate student at we launched a major research program in Canada with Shirk on applied ethics that got a whole lot of, if you like, the people who are now leaders in the field established in the, in the mid-80s and did a whole lot of other interesting things. His research interests are broad and diverse. They include genetics and ethics, end-of-life care and ethics, and aging. He's published widely on issues in research and clinical ethics, and he does a lot of work actually in clinical ethics consulting at the various hospitals and health authorities uh, throughout the province of Newfoundland. He has a particular interest in the concept of, of, uh, of human dignity and its relevance to discussions of genetics and identity. And most recently, uh, Daryl was one of the recipients of the 2018 Governor General's Innovation Award. As a member of the Memorial University of Newfoundland's research team for their groundbreaking discovery and treatment of cardiac muscle disorder, known as arrhythmic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And um, that was a, he gave a talk about the, the, the trail that led to that. He also spearheaded the establishment of life-saving screening methods and changes to important health legislation in the province of Newfoundland. So he comes with an, an awful lot of experience, um, and I think we'll learn from this uh, interesting talk on a topic that is becoming increasingly familiar to us and filling us like the work in ethics is never done. There's just more of it and more of it to be done. <laughs> Del, please, it's your floor now. Thank you, Michael. Well, <clears throat> it's uh, great to be here. Uh, great to be here. Michael was my mentor back, uh, uh, but he's also is my mentor. I consider Michael my continuing mentor, so it's great to be here, and, and thanks for inviting me. So the <clears throat> title of my paper, In a Familiar Voice, um, I, uh, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the title if, uh, because uh, as I look around the room, there are probably some people who wouldn't catch the, uh, the nuance of the title, uh, and so I'll try to explain it as I go. So uh, I'm going to start off with a, a thesis statement here that the intentional termination of a human life, no matter what the circumstance, is a, momo a momentous act. <clears throat> the conditions under which a society agrees it is justifiable justifiable for one human being to end another person's life says something about the moral compass of that society. What it says is open to debate, but it says something. 
and uh, and I want to in this talk sort of contribute to some of that conversation about what exactly are we seeing about uh, about our society as we continue. Of course, we've got legislation now about medical aid and dying, but there's an ongoing conversation, and I, and I think that's very important that we uh, continue on that. Way. So the jumping off point. Oh well, here's a, my objectives. Are to review some of the key historical, legislative, and legal decisions that brought Canada to where it is today with regard to aid. To examine the critical role that women have played in establishing advancing the main agenda in Canada, and then to contrast some autonomy, justice-based arguments in support of main legislation and practice with relational care-based perspectives on end of life. <clears throat> so that's kind of where I'm going to go. I've got quite a bit of material here. If you think I'm talking quickly now, it's only going to get faster. <laughs> but um, my jumping-off point here is uh, is it, this uh, very uh, famous book by Carol Gilligan, published back in 1982, called In a Different Voice. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Carol Gilligan's book is often considered to be almost like a manifesto for second wave feminism. It's referred to widely and continually as a, as a, uh, a, as a much different perspective on how we think about ethics, what, are the, what our priorities should be in ethics, and, and so forth. And uh, so, uh, uh, it's, it's a very important book. In, in, a, in a later edition of the book uh, that, uh, that came out in 1993, this is a quotation from, from her letter to readers. She says, the most basic questions about human living, how to live and what to do, are fundamentally questions about human relations because people's lives are deeply connected psychologically, economically, and politically. Reframing these questions to make these relational realities explicit, how to live in relationship with others, what to do in the face of conflict, she says, as she was looking at these things, she says, I found that I heard women's and men voice, men's voice differently. Women's voices suddenly made new sense, and women's approaches to conflict were often deeply instructive because of the constant eye to maintaining relational order and connection. It was concern about relationship that made women's voices sound different. So that's really the foundation of, of, uh, of her argument that she's presenting in, uh, in, in a different voice. Her own uh, sort of educational and, and, and sort of development, uh, is, she comes out of developmental psychology, and she worked with a famous uh, uh, a researcher in this era, Lawrence Kohlberg, who published extensively on the whole notion of moral development. <clears throat> so this was Kohlberg's uh, kind of uh, taxonomy of how any of us uh, come to develop uh, morally. And so he's, start, he's got these three major uh, phases, pre-moral, the conventional, and the, the principle level. And in, in stage one, he says that, you know, this is the pre-moral stage, and it, 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 it's a very sort of rudimentary stage. It's, it's a punishment and avoidance and obedience are, are what motivate it, the, mo motivates us to act. And he says, you make moral decisions strictly on the basis of, of self-interest, disobey rules if you can do it without getting caught, and if you can get Congress to go along with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, these are our uh, 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 Kohlberg's six stages. And as Kohlberg went about doing this research and he had various kinds of uh, methodology that he developed to sort of uh, uh, kind of test his theory and, and, and so forth, he concluded generally that, that males tended to develop further in this, uh, in this than, than females, for whatever reason, uh, that, uh, that, that males tended to become more sophisticated morally than, than, uh, than women. That was uh, uh, kind of bluntly where Kohlberg was going. Carol Gilligan was one of Kohlberg's uh, PhD uh, students working with him, and this kind of rankled her. And, um, <laughs> and so uh, she uh, uh, reflected on this, and thought that uh, uh, there's something fundamentally wrong or fundamentally missing in our assessment of moral development. And so she came up with her alternative theory, which she uh, published in a different voice. And, and so she contrasted quite dramatically with, with Kohlberg. So whereas Kohlberg uh, emphasized autonomy as, a, as a, is kind of the pinnacle of, uh, of, of where you're trying to go in terms of moral development, Gilligan fo focused much more on care. Uh, so where Kohlberg was formal and abstract, Gilligan was concrete and circumstantial. 
Colbert work uh, focused on rights and rules. Gilligan uh, focused on responsibilities and relationships. Uh, Colbert's uh, ideas are founded on principle. Gilligan is, uh, is it's expressed through, through activities. Uh, the self that Colbert talks about is separate and it's objective. It focuses on justice in terms of our, uh, uh, of our uh, social and interpersonal relationships. Whereas the, for Gilligan, the self is not separate, it's connected, it's, it's relationships. And, and really we're talking about care for one another, not about getting justice for ourself, uh, but rather caring and our responsibilities one to another. So uh, again, relationships for, for Colbert are experienced in terms of reciprocity, um, uh, mediated, not medicated. Somebody said medicated? Yeah, medicated through rules. Oh. <laughs> mediated through rules and grounded in rules, uh, whereas relationships for, for Gilligan are responding to others, mediated through activity of care, grounded in interdependence. So this is uh, the, the contrast that, and, and I think a very, very interesting, important kind of, uh, of uh, complementary. Uh, uh, Gilligan didn't necessarily say that Colbert was completely wrong, it's just that he was incomplete. There was this whole other way of thinking and acting that is expressed much more through, uh, through women's experience than, uh, than the kind of, of, of uh, perspective that, uh, that, uh, that Colbert was, was, uh, was putting forth. So uh, <clears throat> other feminist uh, writers followed in, in, uh, in uh, Gilligan's wake. Nell Nodding uh, published this book originally in 1994 and she called it Caring and Feminine Approach to Ethics and Moral Education. Uh, she came out with a, uh, a later edition. Re re you probably can't quite read the subtitle there, and I can't even hear, but it's, it actually says Caring a Relational Approach uh, because uh, uh, Naughty felt that by focusing simply on feminine, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, saying that, that uh, you know, only, only women can can provide this, this caring kind of thing. But this caring aspect is important to all of our, uh, of all of our ethics and our thinking. And again, uh, she says, relations, not individuals, are ontologically basic. That's, that's her point. Um, so that's Neil Nodding's. Uh, Joan Toronto, uh, another important work, Moral Boundaries. Uh, Toronto says, as, as feminist thinkers have begun to scrutinize Western thought, they have continually discovered that the questions that have traditionally informed the lives of women and the needs of humans to be cared for as they grow up, live, and die have not informed the central questions of philosophers. Uh, and so Toronto, in her book Moral Boundaries, is, is, is what wants to take that on and takes that on. And again, developing this kind of ethics of care. Uh, Virginia Held, another important thinker, uh, published a book called The Ethics of Care in 2006. Many persons will become ill and dependent for some periods of their later lives, including in frail old age, and some who are permanently disabled will need care the whole of their lives. Morality is built on the image of the independent, autonomous, rational individual largely overlook the reality of human dependence and the morality for which it calls. The ethics of care attends to this central concern of human life and delineates the moral values involved. It refuses to relegate care to a realm outside morality. So that in a very brief and, and superficial way in many respects uh, kind of summarizes some of the thinking that's gone on uh, for uh, well over two decades now that has uh, have been led largely by feminist uh, uh, thinkers and has now now travels largely under the uh, under the rubric ethics of care or relational ethics and so forth and, and has been an important contribution uh, to uh, to the ethics literature um, <clears throat> over the uh, last several decades so there's the ethics of care um, and that's the different voice that, uh, that Carol Gilligan says is, uh, is, is, has been brought to our, uh, our moral consciousness, uh, to our moral discourse, uh, largely through the voices of women. Uh, and, and, uh, and some of the psychology and sociology behind this suggest, it, it says that it's largely because women, uh, by nature of their roles in society, they are the nurturers, the mothers, they are, uh, they are caregivers. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they develop this kind of relational response uh, much more uh, naturally, perhaps, than do, uh, do men historically. And that uh, that's underlies this as well. So that's, that's the ethics of care. 
and the, the different voice. I want to turn now to what I call in a familiar voice, because uh, as I've been reflecting on medical aid and dying, uh, as the, uh, that discourse is, has been going on in Canada at least since the 1990s, and we'll talk a little bit about Sue Rodriguez in a moment, uh, but on now through to 2016 when we got legislation in Canada that, uh, that has legalized medical assistance in dying, uh, women have figured prominently in this, uh, in this discourse. Uh, uh, in fact, I'd say that not just prominently, but dominantly in many respects. It's been, it's been the voices of women who have, uh, have been uh, front and center in, uh, in uh, our, our public discussions about medical aid and dying, in the development of legislation, and so forth. But uh, when I'm arguing here, the thesis of my talk is, uh, uh, is that, uh, that this is a familiar voice. It's not the different voice that Carol Gilligan talked about. It's a very familiar voice. Uh, the familiar voice that we hear in the historical notions of autonomy and justice and so forth. And that's not that, again, that's not that that shouldn't be there, but if that's all the conversation that we're going to have, we're missing something, is what I'm saying here. And so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about that. So uh, I've got uh, pictures of uh, two, four, six, eight women here uh, who, are, uh, who have been uh, prominent in this discourse. And it's not that only women have been, uh, have been part of this, but these women uh, in particular have been uh, uh, quite prominent in the discourse. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them as we go through. <clears throat> so uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Carter versus Canada, the, uh, uh, the, the actual piece of legislation that came forward. So, uh, so until, until uh, uh, the February, February 15th Supreme Court decision in Carter versus Canada, the law did not permit anyone, physicians included, to intentionally end or assist in any another person's life. The Carter decision changed all that. So I want to think a little bit, well, well how did we get to that? Uh, how did we as, as Canadians get to that point? And, uh, and I'm going to take you all the way back to the, uh, the uh, first criminal code uh, for Canada, which came, uh, which was actually written in 1892, and uh, the, the uh, first criminal code in the first criminal code, Parliament enacted the, the uh, you know, criminal code, and the, and there were common law crimes of attempting suicide and of assisting suicide. It was against the law in Canada even to attempt suicide. Uh, that was in the criminal code. It was a criminal offense to, to commit suicide, and that, which, on the one hand, seems kind of silly. But what was the rationale? Well, very much the, the notion, underlying notion, is that we as citizens have a duty uh, to each other. And, uh, and if we kill ourselves, we are robbing society of our contribution. Uh, that we are not, first and foremost, individuals who are about our own self-interest. But it really is, as a, uh, as a societal project, it's about us working together to advance society's interests. And so that's the underlying rationale of, 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 the, of the, the criminal code in 1892. Well, by 1972, things, of course, had, had developed, and Parliament uh, decided that, well, it was pretty hard to enforce that part of the criminal code anyway. So they uh, effectively removed uh, attempting suicide from the criminal code. However, uh, they re it remained the case that you could not assist somebody uh, to uh, to, uh, to end their own life. That still remained a section 241 of the criminal code, and so this, this was section 241, that anyone who counsels a person to commit suicide or aids or abets a person to commit suicide is committing an indictable offense uh, and could be imprisoned for up to 14 years. And that remained the law up until uh, 2015. Um, <clears throat> now, also in 1982, which coincidentally, it's the same year that Carol Gilligan wrote her book. Uh, uh, Canada uh, established its, its uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So, uh, and of course, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the language of the Charter is, is about rights. It's about, uh, uh, about individual, uh, the, the rights of the individual vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, other persons in society, what, uh, what society can expect of individuals and, and the limitations that we can in terms of, in, in, of uh, uh, enforcing a social will, if you will, 
on the individual. So uh, section one of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in a uh, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So that section one is very important because all of the other sections of the charter really answer to section one. So, and as we'll see in the Sue Rodriguez case, for example, uh, the, the Supreme Court actually concluded that yes, some of Sue Rodriguez's other rights were violated by the prohibition against assisted suicide, but it, those, her interests were overridden by section one uh, because there were larger societal interests at play uh, that uh, could justify us limiting Sue Rodriguez in that particular case, her individual rights. So let's talk about some of these, uh, these five women from BC. Uh, so uh, uh, a, lo a lot of this takes place out here in BC in terms of that, uh, and maybe it's BC women that are, uh, that are responsible. So there's uh, the, the five people I'm gonna talk a little bit about here are Sue Rodriguez, she died in 1994. Gloria Taylor, who died in, in 2012, Kay Carter uh, died in Switzerland uh, in, in 2010, and her daughter, Lee Carter. The, the Carter decision, when we talk about Carter, uh, is actually not Kay Carter, it's Lee Carter, who's named there, the daughter of Kay Carter. And that's very important, because I think it leads to some confusion, even in how the law is interpreted and applied uh, by, by physicians that I know that are participating in Lee. Um, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, probably the most important and, and, and influential women on this particular page is uh, Justice Lynn Smith, uh, who is the Supreme Court, BC Supreme Court Justice, who actually uh, ruled on the initial uh, Carter uh, versus Canada case. So uh, Sue Rodriguez, well, uh, most of you are probably familiar with Sue Rodriguez, uh, a, a very brave, uh, courageous, uh, <coughs> reasonably young woman. She was in her early 40s at the time. She suffered from, from uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. And uh, in the early 90s, she uh, petitioned the, the, the court uh, 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 for, the, for the right to, to, uh, to assisted death. And uh, she said that her section 241, uh, uh, that section 241 of the criminal code actually was infringing on her section seven and section 15 rights. We'll talk about those in a minute. So it, effectively what she was re seeking was a, a, was a positive right to an assisted death, a positive right to die. Once the, once the uh, or the, once parliament back in 1972 said, well, uh, it's not against the law uh, to, to attempt suicide, they basically said that everybody has a negative right to die. You can, if you want to end your own life, that's fine. Sue Rodriguez said, that may be the case, but I as a disabled person don't have that right. Uh, she said, if, uh, uh, because of the nature of my disease, she said, I don't want to die right now, but I know that because of what I'm suffering from, there's going to become a time when my, when my, uh, illness is so uh, overwhelming that I would rather be dead than alive, but at that point, I won't physically be able to end my own life. So if I want to end my own life, I'm going to have to end it before a time when I would otherwise do it. If you followed the news just a couple of weeks ago, uh, this woman in Nova Scotia, it basically was making the same kind of argument, although she wasn't physically disabled, uh, but that's, a, that's another story. Um, so, and, and that, that seems like a reasonable case. Her Section 7 rights said that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof. She said that her right to life was being, would be deprived because she'd have to kill herself sooner than she wanted to die, and uh, uh, if she couldn't be assisted in that. And, uh, and her Section 15 equality rights says every, every individual is equal before and under the law. And she said, as a, as a disabled person, she wasn't being treated equally. Well, the Supreme Court, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1990, uh, uh, 1993, the Supreme Court ruled against her in a very narrow five to four decision. Uh, they, uh, and as I said before, even though the court agreed that uh, Section 241B of the Criminal Code violated her uh, Section 7 rights, uh, nevertheless, there was a larger uh, public interest in not permitting physician-assisted death, and so they set it aside. 
Justice Beverly McLaughlin was on the Supreme Court. She wasn't the Chief Justice at the time, but she was one of the justices. She wrote a dissenting opinion. She was one of the four that, uh, that opposed what the Supreme Court, uh, uh, what the majority had said. But listen to her language here, as a, uh, since I'm talking about uh, the familiar and the, uh, and the different voice. She says, security of the person has an element of personal autonomy, protecting the dignity and privacy of individuals with respect to decisions concerning their own body. It is part of the persona and dignity of the human being that he or she have the autonomy to decide what is best for his or her body. Uh, so uh, the, the language that she uses, and one can argue, well, you know, this is, these are the kinds of language that you've got if you're talking about charter rights and so forth. Uh, these are the terms uh, that have been set for you. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, one would think that if the general thesis of Carol Gilligan et al. is follows through that there should be some other kinds of considerations there. Uh, there, there largely aren't in, the, in these kinds of discussions. So, uh, <clears throat> so until, uh, again, until February 6th, the su su suicide remained uh, in the criminal code. In the meantime, we have Kay Carter. Now, Kay Carter suffered from spinal stenosis. Now, spinal stenosis is a non-terminal non illness. Uh, most physicians I've talked to, uh, when they learn about uh, her diagnosis and, and prognosis and so forth, they said, given her age, and unless there were other underlying things, she wasn't probably going to die from spinal stenosis. So most physicians that are dealing with the elderly population have, uh, have many patients on their case who can suffer from spinal stenosis. And uh, they figured that, that, uh, that Kay Carter could probably live six, seven years yet. But Kay Carter, in spite of that, said she did not want to live six or seven years. She thought her quality, she felt her quality of life was so low. And so her daughter, Lee, uh, took her to, to Switzerland and, uh, and, and, and uh, went to a, a, a clinic there called Dignitas, and, uh, and her life was ended there uh, at that clinic. Um, <clears throat> of course, technically, Lee Carter was violating violating the law in Canada because Section 241B says it's against the law either to uh, counsel someone or to assist them, and she was assisting her mother, uh, so she was in violation of the uh, uh, criminal code. So uh, this is the case that came before the uh, BC Supreme Court, and, and Lee Carter says, uh, I am one of K's seven children. I believe she should never have been forced to seek a death outside Canada, away from her home, without all of us at her side. So, but notice again that, the, that the, the case that came before the court was Lee Carter, Paulus Johnson, Dr. William uh, Schreitsch. Paulus Johnson is actually Lee Carter's husband, and so uh, he was involved in, in, in helping to take uh, uh, Kay Carter to, uh, uh, to Switzerland. Uh, Dr. Will, Will, uh, William, uh, uh, William Schreitsch, or Schreitsch, uh, he, he's uh, not really involved in that case at all, although he is a physician who said if the law was changed, he would be willing to assist people in their deaths. And then there's the BC Civil Liberties Union and Gloria Taylor. And, and, and that's important, and Gloria Taylor, because Gloria Taylor was kind of a fortuitous case. Um, in fact, Lee Carter had already approached the BC Civil Liberties Union and said, this law is, is wrong. It shouldn't be against the law for me to take my mother uh, to. Uh, uh, so that that was actually reported in the press that the BC the Civil Liberties Union was going to take this to the courts, uh, and Kay Carter uh, or Lee Ta uh, uh, Taylor or uh, Gloria Taylor, sorry, uh, uh, heard of this and said, "Well, if they're going, I'm the kind of person that they should have there." So she was added to the. Uh, to the case uh, late on, but she became kind of the central focus of the case because uh, she suffered, very similar to Lucy Rodriguez, she suffered from ALS. She had a terminal condition. And uh, so uh, uh, she petitioned the court, and much of the discussion, if you read through the Carter decision that, uh, that Justice Lynn Smith wrote, focuses largely on Gloria Taylor because the Supreme Court of Canada had already ruled on a very similar case. She wanted to 
argue why, even though the Supreme Court in 1993 had ruled one way, now, 20 years later, she was going to rule another way on a very similar case. If she was arguing about just Kay Carter, uh, it would have been a, a whole different kind of discussion she would have had to have. Uh, and, and if you read through the whole discussion that Lynn Smith does, uh, uh, Kay Carter figures only incidentally, only insofar as she was the mother of Lee Carter, and Lee Carter had to take her mother to, but it's not, it's not about, uh, about Kay Carter at all. It's not about somebody who didn't have a terminal illness, who was uh, going to be in a de debilitated state, unable to end their own life. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, in fact, uh, uh, Lee Carter was, uh, was somebody who needed to be cared for, uh, uh, and, and desperate as she was in the situation she was. So it's quite different uh, kinds of cases. Did the case for Lee Carter start because the government charged her with a crime? No. She was never charged with a crime. Uh, so how did it get to the Supreme Court? Well, I'll, I'll explain. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she, she, she went to the BC Civil Liberties Union and wanted to, to, to take it to the BC court. And, uh, and the BC court was considering list, uh, taking that on when, when, uh, when Gloria Taylor was added to it. And then it proceeded through the, through the the BC court. So that again is the uh, is the uh, actual uh, uh, case there. Now this is Justice Lynn Smith. She really figures front and center in this because in all of the discussion about medical aid and dying, about overturning Rodriguez, uh, challenging the the the, uh, the initial legal reasoning of the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, it's it the the Supreme Court really uh, doesn't revisit all of those arguments in any rigorous sense. It's Lynn Smith and Lynn Smith only who does that. Because it's, this, it's the BC Supreme Court and only Lynn Smith who listens to all the arguments and writes the judgment. So, uh, and, and there's some interesting things about Lynn, Lynn Smith. In it. At various times, she served on the, the boards of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Now that's one of the plaintiffs here. And I've I'm, I'm always been curious that she never recused herself from this discussion, which you would think on the face of it. And nobody really raised that point. Uh, you know, And irrespective of what your position is on medical aid and dying, it just seems a little bit odd that the Supreme Court Justice, who writes the most powerful, has the most authority in this, in this area, uh, actually was on the board of the BC Civil Liberties Union, who then comes around and, uh, and, and, and brings this case to her as the justice in the Supreme Court. And I've read through that whole thing, and I have to say, it's, uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I've got a, I'm not totally opposed to medical aid and dying, let me say that at the start. But I have to say that I don't feel that there was a really fair reading of all of the arguments there, but as you can read them, you see that she very, very quickly sets aside any opposing argument to the, it was like the, the, the decision had already been made before she started, and she moves on through. But she's a, that's my opinion, I have to say, it's my opinion. Um, so uh, so in, in, in Carter versus Canada then, this is a, and just to bear with me as a, and that, that cartoon on the side is, a, is the camel's nose under the, uh, under the tent because Gloria Taylor became the camel's nose that allowed Lynn Smith to bring the whole camel in under it. So just listen how, uh, um, uh, how she uh, argues this. She says that, this is uh, Justice Smith, she said the claimed infringement of Section 7 rights differs as among the plaintiffs. With respect to Ms. Taylor, the legislation affects her right to liberty and security of the person as was found in Rodriguez. So there, you know, Ms. Taylor is very much like Rodriguez and in addition, the legislation affects her right to life because it may shorten her life. Ms. Taylor's reduced lifespan would occur if she concludes that she needs to take her own life while she is still physically able to do so at an earlier day, uh, if she could be assisted. With respect to Ms. Carter and Mr. Johnson, the legislation affects their rights to liberty because they are at risk of incarceration, at least in theory, for having take, helped their loved one to obtain assisted death in, in certain so. so <clears throat> This is either a very narrow reading about what, uh, what, what the nature of this is, or it's very broad. And, uh, and that's where a lot of the discussion is going on today 
in terms of the, the uh, what the what the legislation actually means and says. So, so the Supreme Court, uh, BC Supreme Court, Court held that Section 241B of the Criminal Code does in, fa in fact infringe Section 715 of the Charter. And, uh, <clears throat> but the BC Court of Appeal, because this then went to the Court of Appeal, and the BC Court of Appeal says, you know, in law, a lower court cannot overturn a higher court. So even though the BC Supreme Court can say that Sue Rodriguez, you know, that Rodriguez was, was limited or wrong or should be overturned, that there are new facts of the case now that should overturn it, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a uh, doctrine in law called stare and decisi, which means except that you have to stand by things decided, that there, there was a precedent set by a higher court, a lower court can't come along and say, no, no, we're setting that aside. So basically this BC Supreme uh, Court of Appeal said, no, you can't set that aside. And then the BC uh, 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 Supreme Court said, well, we're going to appeal this all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and let them look at it again. Now, in, and, and so this is the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada. But the Supreme Court of Canada is, does not uh, go through all of the evidence again. What the Supreme Court of Canada has to do is they simply, the, the Supreme Court justices have to look at the legal reasoning presented by the lower court and decide whether there were any errors in the lower court discussion. And lo and behold, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada at this point now is Beverly McLaughlin. And, uh, and, uh, and she is the, is the Chief Justice, and the Supreme Court of Canada finds that there's no reason, not, uh, no reason to overturn the lower court decision, that the material situation has changed over the 20 years since Rodriguez, uh, that, uh, that the, the, the kinds of concerns that were there in the Supreme Court uh, back in 1993 no longer hold, and effectively, they, uh, in, in February 6 of 2015, they overturn the law, and they give uh, the uh, uh, federal government uh, and, and initially a year that was extended to 16 months to change the law in Canada. So the law was changed in, Bill, uh, in, in June of 2016, Bill C-14, I should keep an eye on my time here. Um, so uh, one other person I want to mention is, uh, is, is uh, Jocelyn Downey, uh, a legal scholar, scholar. Jocelyn, you don't hear as much in the news, but Jocelyn has been very active for the last 15 years at least. Uh, she has been a, a, a real uh, uh, active advocate for overturning the law. She wrote this book a few years back uh, called Dying Justice. And again, Jocelyn, as a legal scholar, emphasizes autonomy-based rights. She says uh, uh, we uh, uh, have to decriminalize medical assistance in dying uh, on the basis of autonomy. She also, incidentally, uh, says that, uh, that uh, the other flip side of her argument is that, uh, that we have to criminalize. Well, we want to decriminalize medical aid in dying. We want to criminalize any physician or hospital that would override an individual patient's desire to continue to be treated. You know, the idea that uh, of futility and fertility arguments, Jocelyn says you know, she's being consistent. Autonomy says that if you want to end your life, you should be able to. But autonomy also says if you want to keep living forever, then society has a responsibility. So she's at least being consistent. Uh, but they're all autonomy-based arguments. And it's autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. And it's a very familiar voice. It's not a different voice at all. Um, so the one last person is Dr. Ellen Weave. Uh, again, you've probably heard of Dr. Weave. She's, uh, she's the most active medical aid and dying physician in Canada. Uh, she, uh, this is a piece that she wrote for The Economist magazine just in August. She says the Canadian Medical Systems in Dying Law has pa was passed in 2016 since then. So this was the, you know, uh, about two years. She said she's, she's uh, provided over 150 assisted deaths. And uh, I know from personal experience with cases that I've been asked to consult on that, that uh, uh, Dr. Weave has a very liberal interpretation of the law and, uh, and very much focused on autonomy and quite an expansive view of autonomy. And uh, um, uh, a 
recent case where uh, uh, that I was uh, uh, informed about, where where uh, local physicians said that this particular patient was did not meet the criteria under the law. They called Dr. Weave, and she, on a teleconference interview, said, "Yes, you meet the conditions, and if uh, you can find the funds and fly me out there, I'll do the deed." Which is uh, uh, disturbing, no matter where you stand on medical aid. So, uh, of course, the uh, the Canadian Council of Academics has been has been tasked with uh, looking at whether or not the medical aid in dying should be expanded. Uh, they've been uh, asked to look at whether we should expand it to uh, uh, allow mature minors, to allow people to, uh, in advance directives, to request it in the event that they can't, you know, through dementia or anything, uh, might be able to, uh, or might need to. And, and also that mental health uh, should be the sole, uh, uh, might be the sole criterion, that, it, that you're suffering from a mental illness, uh, that, uh, that you, uh, you find it unbearable, and that you should uh, be assisted in that. So that's the ongoing conversation. So very quickly, I'm gonna finish up here with a, 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 an appeal that we should at least consider the, a different voice in this ongoing conversation about me. That, uh, that we, uh, we can too quickly lose sight of the, of the role of care and providing care for desperately ill people. If the easy solution is, well, uh, if people are tired of living, uh, and, uh, and you know, we can have a teleconference interview with them from the other side of the country and say, yeah, okay, I'll be there next week. He said, well, I'll be there in 10 days because you need 10 clear day days. Uh, I think that's uh, something we have to be uh, uh, concerned about. Trudeau Lemons is a, a, is a legal scholar from, from Toronto. Uh, Trudeau's from Belgium uh, initially, and, and Belgium is one of the most liberal uh, places in the world for uh, medical aid and dying. And, uh, and so Trudeau has been writing, he's become, as he said to me, he's kind of, kind of becoming the lone voice in the wilderness sort of thing. It's very interesting how quickly things have shifted in Canadian society. For a lot of years, we had an ongoing conversation about medical aid and dying and so forth. Once the law changed, suddenly anybody who raised any kind of an opposing voice is kind of like, how unethical could you be? Like, how would you, you know, undermine people's autonomy in this way. You know? And so uh, this is a, an op-ed piece that he actually wrote with, uh, uh, with uh, I think Willem Lemons is his, is his nephew, and Art Kaplan is a very well-known bioethicist in the US. But there, this is an op-ed piece for the Chicago Tribune that just came out uh, well, a couple years ago now. But they were talking about in, in, uh, in, in Denmark, there, or not Denmark, in the Netherlands, they're, they're uh, are considering that people who are just basically Tired of life, uh, should be able to uh, uh, to uh, uh, ask for assistance in dying, and it should be granted to them. And uh, and as he says here, he says more generally, a, a whole culture of care might gradually erode. The commitment to protect life, especially of those who are disabled and dependent, might increasingly be weighed against the supposed costs and burdens of loss of autonomy and decreasing quality of life. And uh, and so here again is the kind of contrast between. What is the cost of care, and and and, and how does autonomy concerns uh, overcome that? And and uh, we want to try uh, to to bring that back in. So, uh, uh, returning to Joan Toronto's uh, work, she talks about various phases of caring, uh, caring about others, taking care of people, care giving, and care receiving are are, are all parts of this. And uh, and you we might divide this between caring about and caring for, uh, that, uh, that we can care about uh, uh, end of life, but uh, caring for is a, is a much more relational kind of thing. Uh, caring about can be an intellectual thing, and she makes this distinction between, you know, you can care about world hunger, and you can deal with it by writing a check, you know, but uh, are you really caring for people who are, uh, who are suffering? And I think that's an, a, a, an aspect here. And she talks about devaluing care. She says, care has mainly been the work of slaves, servants, and women in Western history. The largest tasks of caring, those attending to children and caring for the infirm and elderly, have been almost exclusively relegated to women. And, and the devaluing of caring for. If we look closely at the kinds of employment opportunities taken by different groups in society, we'll see that caring activities are devalued, underpaid, and disproportionately occupied by the relatively 
powerless in society. And uh, so the, the whole notion of caring, of providing care, I worked in healthcare for 25 years, and I can tell you palliative care has been an uphill battle uh, from day one. And I'm not sure we're all that much further after 25 years of talking about it than we were when I first started out. When medical aid and dying became the law, I could not believe the number of person hours, literally hundreds of, I was at many meetings because I was on the main committee for our health authority. I was at many meetings where there were eight or 10 highly paid professionals sitting for two hours each week discussing how are we going to implement this particular law for a very small minority of the population when it comes right down to it. And, and our palliative care colleagues said, if we ever thought of the modicum of that interest in palliative care over 25 years, maybe we wouldn't be talking about people so desperately uh, you know, fed up with the way the healthcare system treats them and takes care of them uh, or fails to take care of them, uh, that they say, I would rather off be, and I'd rather be dead. So, uh, and so as we, as we developed caring for, we are devalued caring for, we also develop, devalued care receiving. Since our society treats public accomplishments rationally and autonomy as worthy qualities, uh, care is devalued insofar as it embodies their opposites. One way, uh, one way in which we socially construct those who need care is to think of them as pitiful because they require help. And, uh, um, and it, it's interesting, um, and I, I took out a couple of slides here, but uh, um, in Newfoundland, we've, uh, even though we've got a small population and so forth, we've had, we've had a very low uptake on medical aid and dying, um, uh, uh, as compared to, even on a per capita basis, very low uptake. And, uh, and it was suggested in one of the uh, uh, news stories, and I may have those slides in here yet, I'm not sure, but uh, that uh, the reason was because the uh, uh, religious institutions had asked for an institutional exemption that if you were a, you know, a faith-based nursing home, you wouldn't have to provide it, and that was it. And uh, I was interviewed by, by CBC Radio there, and I said, well, that's one possibility, but I think it's very slim. I said, you know, Newfoundland's a poor society. People in Newfoundland have, have, uh, have been desperately poor, and they've learned to rely upon each other. And we know from, the, from, uh, from looking statistically uh, at, at Oregon, for example, that has been keeping statistics since the 1990s about who is most likely to ask, ask for uh, medical assistance in dying or physician-assisted death in the, in the States. It's uh, people who are uh, generally well-educated, better educated, upper middle class. The poor, the people who have always uh, s suffered anyway and have had to learn to depend on each other to get along, they don't ask for medical assistance. I mean, it's people who have always been independent and have never, uh, have, have always thought relying on another person was somehow an insult to them. That they're, uh, as one of the physicians said, uh, a physician who actually uh, 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 offers or participates in medical aid and dying said to me, he says, it's the venture capitalists that I see most often that are asking for medical aid. So, uh, and then this actually, the slide actually talks to that. Well, there's the Newfoundland. So in a different voice, this is actually uh, one of your colleagues here in Nita Ho, she said, uh, she said, informed by feminism, this is a chapter that she wrote for a book called Choosing Death, Autonomy, and Ableism, and she basically uh, uh, critiques the, the sort of uh, narrow notion of autonomy, and I'm running out of time. I've written about what I call the, uh, the aesthetics of pain and suffering. Uh, our, our terms compassion and sympathy, both, the roots of both of those words mean to suffer with. Uh, to, to be a companion in somebody's suffering, to be sympathetic is to, uh, is to, to suffer with them. Uh, but we don't want to suffer with in our society. We want to, it's not that we want to ignore the problem, uh, but we want to deal with it uh, quickly. If you've never read the book Tuesdays with Maury, you should do so. It's a wonderful book about a man who has a degenerative, debilitating illness, uh, who uh, decides that, you know, there's one line that always stuck out to me. Is, you know, he thought that having somebody else uh, wipe his bum would be the most indignity. But when it came right down to it, he had a bunch of loving people around him. And you know, wiping your bum 
Yeah, I'd be happy if I'm away. It wasn't the worst thing in the world anyway, you know, because uh, he was still being loved and cared for. And um, so uh, just a couple of concluding thoughts. I, uh, some of the stuff I'm trying to put into the written version of this paper. Palliation is more a philosophy of care than a medical act. It requires broad social engagement across the spectrum of disciplines to attend to the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of patients, families, and communities. As such, it trades on social and relational values of caring and community, which are broad and amorphous, and hence difficult to quantify and control. Put otherwise, it takes a village. Medical assistance in dying, on the other hand, is narrow and focused and trains on more manageable notions of individual rights and personal choice. It is focused, quantifiable, and eminently manageable, and hence more amenable to technological control. But otherwise, it takes a village. So just one, a, a recent book called uh, My Father's Wake, How the Irish Teach Us to Delay with a Loving Mood. I uh, just came across this book a, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, but the author says, to be human is to bear the burden of our own mortality mortality, and to strive in grace to help others carry theirs, sometimes lightly, sometimes with great courage, and accepting death into our lives, our community. We learn the first and oldest lessons of humanity, how to be brave in irreversible sorrow, how to reach out to the dying, the dead, and the maimed, how to go on living no matter how great the rupture or loss, how to face your own death. Kids in Toronto is trying to make its own rules about mature minors being able to uh, request and successfully have made. What's going on there? I didn't know that. Oh, okay. and I'm not sure what's going on there because it would seem to be uh, what might be going on there is that they already have inside knowledge about what the what the, uh, 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 what the CCA is what, what the CCA is going to recommend. But even if the CCA recommends that. Mm -hmm. There'd still have to be amendments made to the law to allow that. So I'd be very, I'd, I'd be curious about that happening, and, uh, and uh, I'd, uh, I'd be surprised that the hospital lawyers aren't all over that, saying, "What are you doing?" To me? So, you know. I also wonder here in BC because of the the Infant Act, which gives authority to children to be part of the decision making, not only to assent to decisions that are being made now but also to consent to decisions as they, as they prove their uh, autonomy, as they prove their capacity. Um, I think particularly of children who've had cancer for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and now they're coming to that age where they are turning to their oncologist, pediatric oncologist, and asking them, is this something that I'm eligible for? So I'm wondering if you're going to see smaller court challenges like we did with, with Carter. Uh, in the very same fashion, even as other ruling is coming out, or at least there may be a prov provision, or there may be further studies, or there may be um, some acknowledgement that there, there is an opening here. Right. Um, but I, I certainly get a sense from working with uh, the BC pediatric oncologists that they are very guarded in this regard, right. um, very, very guarded in terms of going down this particular path, even though they face these kinds of scenarios and I think they're very used to working with sort of the principle of double effect, um, where they see that they have very good pain management and that pain management could be escalated to other levels um, when, when um, the suffering is grievous and irremediable, but without taking the same kind of course of action, if you understand me. Why is it called the Infant Act? That's well, for, it's, it's so we're at in, in the UK it's called the Children Act. There's a great movie out right now called the Children Act as yeah. well. But the Infant Act mm -hmm. applies to anyone up to the age of nine, uh, 18 and under. Right. right. Oh, is that right? I yeah. didn't know that was the name of the act. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of a unique entity, but I'm sure it will be um, considered with whatever happens federally in terms of how yeah. it is applied. Talking about infanticizing mature minors. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Even if a caring ethic was taken into the courts, would you ever see the Supreme Court decision being changed? Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, I know I don't think the Supreme Court decision is going so to be changed. So we have this law now, regardless of <coughs> changing of autonomy versus caring versus. Yeah, I, I, I'm suggesting that uh, that we, uh, you know, the law is the law, and uh, and it's not going to change. 
but what I'm thinking is that we simply we we haven't had the different voice in this conversation in Canada at all. Uh, you know, it's been uh, I mean, it's been it's it's been there uh, through palliative care uh, historically, but it's it's never got any traction, and I'm afraid that we're losing whatever little bit of traction we might have had, and uh, and because you know the. The issues that have gone to the, uh, the Canadian Council of Academics, you know, are, are really more extensive, autonomy-based arguments. Uh, it, it, largely, the uh, and, and if you read through uh, uh, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court decision, and, and uh, there were many palliative care uh, physicians who came and argued that we can provide this. Uh, it, it is uh, no, we do, it, it's not available everywhere. We need to have it. Uh, we need more resources and so forth. And 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 Justice Smith would say, kind of, well, I hear what you're saying, but that's not a really concern. You know, autonomy kind of trumps that, uh, that sort of thing. We can't wait uh, any longer. You know? And uh, and if you look at what's happened in Canada uh, in two years, we've gone from zero to a hundred. You know, we're right up there with Belgium uh, in, in two years. It took Belgium, I, I actually gave a talk, I was I just got back from Australia, and I, I gave a talk at the uh, Australian Bioethics Congress, Congress uh, uh, about uh, some of the statistics in Canada, how quickly we've got there in, in, in two years. And there was, a, there was a researcher from Belgium there uh, who was completely amazed that we had got to the point that we are well over 3,000 uh, uh, people have. Uh, I mean, Dr. Weeb has done 150 on her own. Well, that was back in August. She might be I'm not sure where now. But, but uh, uh, and I'm a little concerned about the Dr. Weebs, you know, like the, 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 the uh, what the, <clears throat> the legislation is fairly vague on particulars. Pretty well anything that when they lay out the criteria that you have to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition, your, your death has to be reasonably foreseeable. Well, you know, every one of us, our death is reasonably foreseeable. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and one of the physicians I work with, he said, well, you know, Lee Carter, she was gonna uh, live at least six or seven years, so reasonably foreseeable. But, and I just pointed out to him, said, well, you know, the le legislation isn't really about, uh, well, it's, I keep forgetting whether K is the mother. <laughs> I think K is the mother. It's not about K Carter. It's about Lee Carter and what she did, not about what K Carter was suffering from. And again, Gloria Taylor was uh, was the fortuitous case. You know, she uh, she stepped forward and said, what about me? And that's it. So, and, and really, it did become about her, even though she's the sort of add-on at the end of Yes. I was, th thank you for that. I just laying out all that history so carefully, I just found that extraordinarily helpful. And I was struck by your point of, that Carol Gilligan's book came out the same year as the charter. And, and you know, you talk about how it, like, we're kind of losing ground in terms of being able to articulate in a meaningful way and act in a meaningful way on the method of care. When it seems like that's all kind of wrapped up in, in section one. Like right. section one is really important, but is never really articulated. And the charter then goes on in a very different direction, right. spelling out all of those things. And it and the Supreme Court is all about the charter. Yeah. So I, I don't have a question. I, I just found that an interesting right. observation that you know we had at that time in the early eighties, at least in the academic world, and, and, and you know Carol Gilligan was well known that people were starting to shake their heads and say, there isn't, there's another way to articulate these ideas and they're valid, and how different a charter might be, perhaps, if it had happened at a different time. <coughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I'm intrigued by the, by the notion of what, in a way, I mean, what you're, what you're saying, the, the different voice that was not heard was about what I describe as a need loss of care. But, but I think realistically, was there an ethos of caring that lay behind, for example, the prohibition of suicide? Was there an ethos of caring that lay behind the idea that you couldn't allow people to do that? Or was that just an ethos of 
asserting there were certain kinds of duties and we're going to deny certain kinds of rights. So in other words, the language, how do you get that? In other words, if we were to articulate, we want an ethos of caring, we know the ethos of caring is limited, as you said, by value of care, struggles around the edges of things. How many of the people before this lived in an ethos of caring, and how much is the response to all this, in part because there isn't an ethos of caring? I mean, and how, I, I how, think you're I mean, right. In some ways, one wants to, I mean, I like the idea of like living with two thoughts. I mean, one is I do prize autonomy. On the other hand, I also prize caring. I mean, you know, I think of living in caring relationships, very, very important in my life, in the life of people I've worked with and stuff like that. But it's almost like it doesn't take easy route in the, in if you like, in the law and stuff like right. that. It's more about a lot of other kinds of relationships to each other that we might assist in some kinds of ways with the law, but I'm not sure how, if that's the best place to argue for an ethos of care. Right, and, I'm, and, and I think you're right, I, I, as I said, and I, I sort of passed over it quickly, but you know, because of the charter, because of the language of the law, you know, in a certain sense, these, you know, there was no alternative language uh, when you're arguing in the law. Although, if you read through at the Rodriguez case and so forth, you know, uh, we have, we, I gave a little quotation from, from uh, uh, Justice McLaughlin uh, at the time, but there is plenty of room for raising other kinds of discussions in there, but they're, they're largely being muted and silenced. And I think you're right. I don't think, you know, the original law, prohibition of suicide, was about care. It was about responsibilities that we have to one another in society. Uh, we do find, uh, and I've got a little bit that I'm starting to work on in this, in this as well, I, I, what I call the, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, I took that slide up, now I can't remember what I call it, but there's, 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 there, there's kind of a, a, a circumstantial care, you know, where, where, uh, uh, where your circumstance, because, you know, we, we look at, you know, in, uh, in society, I think if you looked at California right now, in the midst of all that fire, there are people who are reaching out and caring for people that they would never even talk to otherwise. We see this all the time in disaster situations. Suddenly, uh, you know, uh, ethnic, economic, all kinds of boundaries are just broke down, and we reach out in our basic humanity and care for each other. And then, as, and as that, that's, I think, a little bit that goes on in my analysis of, and again, this is just my speculation, there's no, you know, uh, that what happened in Newfoundland, where there's very little uptake, is that Newfoundlanders, they've got large families, they do have a religious tradition of Catholicism and so forth, but it's, it's, it's not sort of, well, I'm, I'm obligated by, you know, God demands that I do this. They're, they're just a very caring kind of communities. And the idea that, that I would be a burden to my family, uh, you know, that would be an insult to my family to tell them that I don't want to be a burden. You're not a burden. You know, you're, we love you. We, you know, we don't want to see you in pain. We want to have good pain control and so on and so forth. But the idea that you would exit now and deprive us of your and of even the opportunity to care for you, you know. Now I'm speculating. I'm, you know, and maybe more hyperbole than anything else. But uh, I, it seems that that within our within our the purview of what we've got before us in terms of ethical options is certainly not. Uh, inconceivable, uh, although autonomy is is it, it, it's so uh, it flows so easily off the tongue, you know, and you know, individual and my right and you know, it, it uh, uh, it's what the law can deal with because the law has to you know, deal with these precise kinds. That's what my last slide there is about. You know, that, you know, the care is broad, it's amorphous, it's not readily amenable to this kind of control. Uh, but I think it's a conversation that we want to continue to raise. And I'm afraid as we continue down this road, you know, and Jocelyn, when I read some of the stuff that Jocelyn, Jocelyn is sometimes, she's bombastic about people that raise any kind of, you know, like, she's, you know, like, Jocelyn, where's the different voice? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, anyway. Uh, intriguing, intriguing, intriguing kind of thing. There was a, years ago I was on a 
project called the Cross-Cultural Approach to, bio, to Bioethics, where we work with Asian partners, Thai partners, and uh, people from across Canada. But Peter Stevenson, who's an anthropologist at uh, UVic, talked about, uh, he'd written an article, um, he called it, he died too soon, and it was about a Hutterite community where a man goes away to like Calgary for medical care and he dies without being able to take leave of his family. The whole family feels this sense of deep loss, like you ought to be able to die in community, you ought to be able to take leave of your community in a certain kind of way. And there was this feeling of just incompleteness because it was a caring community, but you were isolated from your community. He, was, he died in circumstances where you couldn't have any of that. He couldn't take his leave of the thing. But then I'll return to a question that still bothers me. At the end, a caring community might say, it's all right. It's OK for you to go. You've borne some top of the burden. Um, you know, Why can't you, at that point, say that can be combined with the right to die? Like, I, you know, as I said, I'm not I'm not just diametrically opposed to that. You know. I used to, uh, used to when, before it was the law, I used to uh, quote uh, Grant uh, Gillett, who's a uh, mm -hmm. New Zealand uh, bioethicist and physician. Okay. And a paper that he wrote years ago, he concluded it and said, uh, uh, physician assisted suicide must remain against the law. However, there may be exceptional circumstances where it's the ethical thing to do. You know. And, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and, the emphasis there was on exceptional circumstances. You know. uh, we are uh, we are medicalizing suicide in this in this country right now. You know we're moving steadily toward that. That uh, that you know you in the Netherlands they've been practicing uh, physician assisted suicide since the 70s, 1970s. It only became the law I think in 2001 in the Netherlands, but they've been practicing it for over 50 years. They're getting now. You know, a couple of generations on to the place where they're starting to talk. We are doing this uh, at hyperspeed uh, in Canada. You know, we've uh, we've swallowed the Kool Aid of uh, individual autonomy and, uh, and, and 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 rights that uh, that really truncate our ability to have other kinds of conversations. In fact, to raise them, uh, you know, I, uh, I I've talked to Trudeau because uh, Trudeau sits on the Canadian Council of Academics and he says he feels like a pariah. There, you know that the that it's uh, it's just uh, it's it's so difficult to to raise this idea that maybe we have to slow down this conversation. No, it's simple. It's it's individual autonomy. You know, it's an individual's right. And we've got to extend that. And so there you go. Well, perhaps it's I think it's our appointed time to end our. Our broadcasting <laughs> such as it is. Thank you very much, Carol. Well, thank you. Thank you.